Florida voters may decide this time next year whether or not to legalize medical marijuana. And based on the early polls here, there seems to be a growing momentum for making pot legal with a prescription. Not Investigates found that in California, the abuse of the law there is rampant. There is a broad interpretation of the law, and getting a license to purchase marijuana is easy, quite frankly. And that ease is what has at least one local politician concerned. Southern California, known for its surf, its sunsets, its stars, and this, medical marijuana. Venice Beach is Southern California's second busiest tourist destination, second only to Disneyland. And while a lot of folks come for the shops and the sights and sounds, others come here just to get a prescription for pot. Shops like this are up and down the boardwalk with salespeople waving customers in, except for us. There's people inside who feel very uncomfortable. We watched as over and over people came out carrying a white envelope with their prescription. This guy told the doctor, he heard his shoulder skiing. It was relatively easy. Uh, took a couple minutes. We also saw these three 20-somethings get their marijuana prescriptions. But what was your medical reason? I don't know. I can't sleep at night. In three days in California, we saw mostly young people getting their prescriptions and then their pot. It's so easy. These teenagers also bragged to me about how easy it was. What kind of problem? Uh, you see that you can't see legs. legs. With that information, I went into a different office down the boardwalk. They asked for my driver's license. I then filled out a form, provided some personal information, and during my doctor consultation, was instructed to say I had trouble sleeping. There you go. The physician statement and approval for medical marijuana. They then gave me the location for one of the thousands of marijuana shops. Reportedly, there are more here than Starbucks. The one we were directed to had a card, redeemable for a free joint. There are so many places to buy your pot in Southern California. There's even an app that shows you all the locations. Where I'm standing, within one mile, 13 businesses like this that really basically are on every corner. From the main drag to residential areas, we saw the Green Cross signifying marijuana shops. And that's the concern of this Cocoa Beach City Commissioner. Think of the people with families. They don't want to walk by somebody waving that sign. Skip Williams wants to get some ordinances on the books now, so that at least Cocoa Beach doesn't look like Venice Beach. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be good. Now, we did not break any laws in doing our story. We told the truth and were forthright with names, addresses, and IDs. I was told that if I was going to bring the pot back to Florida, I should pack it in something with a strong smell to throw off the drug dogs at the airports. Unreal. This is so fascinating. As we watch this, I just can't believe how easy it was for you to get that license. I didn't go out there to get a license. I went out there to do the story, but found how easy it was to go in. And by the way, this is my license, and there you go. It's gone. In terms of the marijuana, it came in two containers like this. We also dumped that out. Yeah, you didn't bring it home with you. And uh, we were talking earlier that you've had a, a lot of people call you and, and you've gotten a lot of uh, tweets and things about this story. It sparked a big debate. But this is really not your investigation. It's not about whether or not pot should be legal. No, it's not about the legality of it, but the unintended consequences. Because what happened in California, they're trying to unwind it now, right. is they allowed it, and now they're trying to close those shops, but they're on the books, they're grandfathered in. So the importance is, because everyone thinks this is going to get voted on soon and likely will be passed, putting those ordinances on the books because we found, as I said, hundreds of those shops. You've got a lot of people talking. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Okay, I just wanted to play that video real quick, just uh, number one, to, to kind of warm you up um, to what we're about to hear, and then also uh, just to kind of, so you could see what was going on in some of the other states. Um, my name is Melanie Black, and I'm the Executive Director of Drug Free Collier. And I'm very proud today to uh, bring an individual here who actually had been a part of our luncheon a few years back and, and, and discussed the marijuana issue with us before. Um, but now more than ever, it seems like this is the hot topic. Uh, and as we know, it, it very well could be going on ballot here very soon. So um, I want to welcome Calvina Fay. She's the executive director of Drug Free America Foundation and Save Our Society from Drugs. And they're leading the opposition on this marijuana legalization issue. And they're actually helping the other states battle with this current uh, issue that, that, that they have faced or are facing just as we are. Um, and she also is assisting the states that have legalized it and getting the statistics to show one way or the other what are the effects on the marijuana. So um, without further ado, I want to go ahead and bring her up here. I know your time is very precious as well. So Calvina? Can I Thank you, Melanie. 
Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, drove up this morning from uh, St. Petersburg. I had a little bit of rain along the way and a couple of little accidents, but managed to get here all in one piece. So it's good to see some of the folks that I've uh, met before and to meet some new folks. Um, just to give you a little background of the two organizations that I represent, Drug Free America Foundation is a 501c3, which means it's charitable, and it's a drug policy organization, and it educates. It educates about the harms of drugs, and it educates about uh, what policies work and don't work, and you know why we need good policy to protect our families and our communities. Um, we don't deal just with marijuana. Some people think we do because that seems to be the most popular issue out there. Uh, that causes me to be in the public a lot, but um, we've dealt a lot with the prescription drug abuse problem. Um, we've done several summits on it. We have another one coming up next month. Um, we've dealt with the meth issue. We've dealt with um, synthetics. So it isn't, we aren't just about marijuana. Then our other organization is Save Our Society from Drugs, and it's a 501c4. That means that it's a nonprofit. Nobody owns it but it can engage in lobbying. And we believe in order to be effective, you not only have to educate about the drug issue and drug policy, but you have to actually be able to influence it and lobby for good policy. So the two organizations work hand in hand um, to achieve that. Um, I want to just kind of give you a wake up call before I jump into everything. We have several things that are going on around the country right now, and I might say around the world because Drug Free America Foundation doesn't just work in this country. We actually have what's called non-governmental um, NGO status through the United Nations, and we do a lot of international work. So we're always looking at drug policies all over the world and what works and doesn't work. And I can tell you that uh, while we've seen some reductions in particular in things like we, we have brought down the prescription drug problem some, still a lot of work to be done, um, we have certainly brought down meth use and heroin use in the country, but we have a, a ever-growing increase in marijuana use, particularly with our young people. And I'll talk a little bit about why we're seeing that. The thing that bothers me is not only do we have an increase in the number of young people using, but we have a tremendous increase in daily use. It used to be when I grew up, I hardly knew anybody that smoked it, and they only smoked it like on a weekend or at a party or something. Now we have a growing trend of daily use, and we're also seeing multiple times in one day. I mean, I've talked to young kids that are using six and seven times a day. That means they're stoned all the time. So to me, that's very alarming. Plus, we're seeing that the marijuana potency, the level of the THC, the stuff that gets you high, has dramatically increased, and I'll show you some of those specific numbers in a few minutes. But what that means is that not only are they smoking it more often, but each time they're smoking, they're getting a much higher concentration of the THC. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the research to show you why I'm very concerned about that in a few minutes. We have some new and dangerous methods for people to use marijuana. Um, if, you ha if you're not familiar with the terminology of dabbing, D-A-B-B-I-N-G, I encourage you later, make yourself a note and uh, Google that, dabbing marijuana or marijuana dabbing, um, and take a look at that because what they're doing is um, extracting the THC out of marijuana so that they're getting anywhere from 40 to 100% THC. Very, very, very powerful stuff. Um, the other method is, um, you know, they're creating a lot of food products now with marijuana in it, the marijuana butter. Uh, you hear about these explosions with butane being used in the process, and they're getting something like 40% THC or higher in that. So we're very concerned about that. And then along with, people talk about legalization, and a lot of people in their mind, they think it's just legalizing the use or the possession of marijuana. But what is happening is it's legalizing the production of it, the growing of it, the trafficking of it, uh, the commercialization of it. So it's becoming normalized in, um, especially with our youth. And I'll show you the results of some of that in a few minutes. And then of course we have this emergence of synthetic drugs. You hear people talk about synthetic marijuana. It's not really synthetic marijuana. It's chemicals sprayed on um, leafy materials and it mimics some of the marijuana symptoms uh, except for that 
it's much more severe and actually we've had some very serious injuries and even some deaths as a result of it. So I want to pause and then I want to tell you that these are our problems. This isn't just happening in another country. It isn't just happening in, you saw the footage from California um, where things are legal out there now and, and really um, very prevalent. But there are problems right here in Florida. We are seeing these increases with our young people here. We're getting reports of the dabbing, of um, food products being made from the THC and the marijuana. So it is happening here and as Melanie mentioned, we do have a proposal for the legalization of marijuana in our state under the guise of medicine, which I will talk about a little. We currently have, just to give you an overview of what's happening in the country, we have 14 states that have decriminalized marijuana. And the term decriminalization varies widely. It can mean one thing in one state, it can mean another in another state. So I'd have to spend another hour to explain to you all of that, but just know that it means that instead of going into jail, they're getting fines or they're getting diversions or what have you, and not all of it's bad. I mean, I'm a big supporter of drug courts when it's low-level first-time offender to get their attention and perhaps get them turned around and stop using. I don't think those kind of people belong in jail. So, but we do have 14 states that have gone down that, that route. Um, we have 21 plus, state, plus the District of Columbia that have legalized marijuana under the guise of medicine, and I'm going to show you in a little bit why it's really more about legalization than it is about medicine. We have two states, that would be uh, the state of Colorado and the state of Washington, that have legalized marijuana for recreational purposes, or as they say, for non-medical purposes. Those two states have had marijuana legal under the guise of medicine for quite some time now, and they came back with another effort to make it legal. There were a couple of other states um, at that same time that were targeted, um, Arkansas and, uh, well, Arkansas was med uh, medical, uh, the state of Oregon was targeted. So we were able to defeat that, but we did not in those two states. We have, um, at least 10 states, and this varies from day to day, we find out new stuff, things get changed and what have you, but at least 10 states that are targeted for full-blown legalization, and we have over 20 states that are targeted to legalize marijuana under the guise of medicine, including the state of Florida. So as I said, our state is a primary target for the legalization and normalization of, of uh, marijuana. In Florida, um, for a couple of years now, we've had House Bill 1139 sponsored by um, Edwards with the companion bill in the Senate by Senator Clemens to legalize marijuana as a medicine. We um, expect to see those bills come again. They may have a different number to them, I'm not sure yet, but we do expect to, to see that again in our state legislature. There is a potential bill uh, that isn't actually filed yet, but we may see that would legalize a specific strain of marijuana and it's being promoted for use by children. Um, and then of course, I'm sure that everybody's very aware if you watch the, uh, the news clip that we are facing a potential ballot initiative um, on our ballot in November to legalize marijuana as medicine. It's sponsored by a group that used to call themselves Puffum or People United for Medical Marijuana. When John Morgan entered the picture, he renamed it uh, United for Care. That certainly sounds better. So let me take a step back for a minute before I actually talk about the initiative and let me ask the question, is marijuana really all that bad? I mean, um, our president recently said it's no, no worse than alcohol. I think that that wasn't a very um, responsible statement because after all, even though alcohol is legal, and is socially acceptable, we know that it's not a harmless drug. We know that it gets misused. We know that um, people get addicted to it. We know that it destroys lives, it destroys livers and what have you. So let's look at the marijuana issue. Here's what the research tells us. I'm, and I'm gonna talk about this not from my um, opinion, but strictly from what the research says. We have a, um, an international scientific and medical forum on drug abuse that is a division of Drug Free America Foundation that consists of doctors and researchers. So I, 
I talk to these researchers and these physicians on a regular basis. The research comes into my office on a regular basis. I can't say that I read every word of everything because I would never get out of my chair if I did, but I do look at it and the more prominent stuff, I really read it very carefully. If I don't understand it, I do talk to the researchers to get them to explain it to me and that does happen sometimes because you can't always understand scientific um, mumbo jumbo. But what the research tells us, and this was a, a study that was published in the British Journal of Medicine, so it shows, and there are other studies that support this, that adolescents who start using marijuana before the age of 18, when their brains were still developing, and continued to use into adulthood, experienced as much as an eight point drop in their IQ. This was a huge study. This was a very solid study. Some studies are iffy because you have a small group or it's for a short period of time. This one was a very solid study and this one really concerns me. I mean, let's face it, I, I'm sure that everybody in here thinks your kids and your grandkids are geniuses, right? They're not. I mean, there may be one or two in the room, but most kids are of average intelligence. And, and especially if they're right on the border of being average intelligence, they lose eight points, they can be below average. So to me, that's a significant thing. The research also shows us that marijuana use is linked to the onset of psychosis at a younger age. Frequent marijuana use in teenage girls predicts later depression, anxiety, and, and with, with the daily users. You know, that to me is what bothers me the most about marijuana is that there's plenty of evidence now that it, it affects the brain. And the brain is who we are. It literally is who we are. And most of us are fortunate that we're born with healthy, normal brains and have the ability to function normally. But using a drug and having our kids use a drug that can affect the brain, to me, is, is very scary. And the more I see, and the studies just keep coming out about the link to mental illness, in particular schizophrenia seems to be a big link there. Now, now the scientists are not ready to say that marijuana causes that. But they are saying that if you're predisposed, it can, can bring it out at an earlier age. They're saying that it can make it more severe, it exacerbates the problem. And now they're even starting to question, in some cases, it may be a cause. Again, that's not a concrete thing yet. But it's like playing with Rus Russian roulette with a kid's brain when they're using marijuana. And not limited to just kids. I mean, it does affect adults also. What happened here? I got turned off. I lost my screen. I, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to turn behind myself. My screen went away. <laughs> Pardon me a second. I don't know what happened to it. It just disappeared. It's black. There you go. Oh, sorry. Oh, just it bang like the went screen. to sleep. <laughs> okay, I'll just bang the screen. Okay. Um, there was also a recent study by the Northwestern University that found that marijuana users have abnormal brain structure and poor memory and that chronic marijuana abuse may lead to brain changes resembling schizophrenia. The study also reported that the younger the person starts to use marijuana, the worse the effects become. You see, we know now, because we can actually look at the human brain without, you know, it used to be you had to wait for somebody to die and then you dissected to look at it. Now, because of um, PET scan capability, we can actually look at the human brain. We can see that when um, people use drugs, it affects the blood flow to the brain and what have you. And they've been able to see that there is an impact on the brain here. And now we can see that the brain doesn't actually stop developing until a person gets into their early to mid-20s. So it's very important for children that we protect that brain while it is developing because it will affect the way in which the brain develops. So I mentioned the potency of marijuana. Let me just show you briefly what's happened with it. Back in 1975, when I was a young person, the rate of THC, the average rate, this is not the highest, not the lowest, but the average rate was 0.74%, less than 1%. In um, 2009, the average rate jumped to over 10%, and some of the samples we were seeing in 2009 actually exceeded 30% with THC levels. Today, the rates, it was predicted by Dr. Mahmoud 
El Sole, who runs the marijuana farm at the University of Mississippi, who grows the marijuana that the government provides for research purposes. He had predicted that we would hit 15% average THC rate by 2019. What I'm hearing now is we're right there at it right now. It's running 14 to 15% average rate. So you can see that it's jumped quite a bit. Then I mentioned earlier the honey oil, um, the, the products that are being produced hitting 40% plus. This is when you hear about these explosions. This is what's being made. Um, I picked up a High Times magazine. Everybody know what High Times magazine is? It's you know all about how to grow marijuana and improve it and what have you. Um, I picked up one in June. Somebody brought it to my attention, so I went out and got a copy of it. And they run a contest every year, the Cannabis Cup. So the Cannabis Cup in 2012, uh, winners were profiled in there, page after page, colorful pictures and everything, of the strains that were in the top 20. And what I found interesting was, of those top 20 that you see listed here, uh, one of them was 19.72% THC. That was the lowest. And the highest was just under 25% THC. That's pretty powerful stuff. It's nothing. I, I actually think that maybe we want to consider renaming marijuana because it doesn't even resemble what was smoked back in the 60s and 70s. It's totally different stuff. Why is this a problem? Because parents who might have used back then and, and were okay, you know, they came through it, don't realize that their kids are smoking something entirely different today. And so some parents say, well, it's just pot, it's just a phase, they'll get through it, and they don't realize that their kids are really smoking something a whole lot more dangerous. By the way, most of this, there, I think there were two exceptions of these 20, top 20, but most of it, these, these strains came from medical marijuana dispensaries. These growers run mer medical marijuana dispensaries. So this is the kind of stuff people are getting under the label of medicine. Pretty, pretty powerful stuff. So I asked the question, is marijuana medicine? You know, the answer of, to, to that question is yes. It actually is. However, it's, it's got a very narrow answer to it. Marijuana contains hundreds, hundreds of compounds in it. And some of those compounds in there are what we call cannabinoids. Of the cannabinoids, one so far has been shown through valid scientific research to literally be a medicine. It's the THC. So decades ago, the THC was isolated from the marijuana plant. It was replicated in synthetic form. It went through the FDA process. It was FDA approved. And it's been prescribed for decades now by doctors. We have no problem with that. It's the way you develop medicine. There is another compound in marijuana right now, another cannabinoid, CBD, that it is very likely at this point has medicinal value. It's been undergoing research. It is in a phase right now of being going through clinical trials. In other words, the lab research is done. They're now in limited uh, controlled environments actually testing it with human beings. And we have no problem with that. If it goes through that process and it's shown to be an effective medicine, that's fine. But Marijuana has, remember, all those other hundreds of compounds, many of which are harmful. Um, marijuana, when it's smoked, actually has more cancer-causing agents in it than tobacco does. And we all know how bad tobacco is. So here are your products, Marinol, um, on the far left top. And then next to it, Sesamet. It's marketed in the uh, European countries under the name of Sesamet and dronabinol, which is the generic name you see down in the bottom left. And to the far right there is a product known as Sativax, which is going through the process now. Sativax is a little different because it's not a synthetic. It's actually derivatives from the marijuana plant. And it has been approved in some countries and is going through the FDA process here in the United States. So you see, we don't need to legalize a weed to have medical marijuana. We have it. It's, it's available. 
And I am all in favor of this, supporting the research for looking at other compounds, but it's important that we do it the right way. Um, the FDA process, and, I, and I'll be the first to tell you, FDA, the FDA is not perfect, but it is the best we have. We don't want to go back to what I call the stone age, <laughs> play on words there, of when somebody could just declare anything, any tonic, a medicine, and go out and peddle it to people. People got hurt doing that. Some of you may be old enough to remember the days when Laetril was rushed to the market and people died from Laetril. And there was a time when, do you, do you know why snake oil, is, snake oil medicine term exists? People were selling um, the snake venom as a medicine. People were selling crude oil as a medicine. We don't want to go back to those days. We need to keep moving forward. FDA, like I said, is not perfect, but it's the best we have and we shouldn't circumvent that process. It helps us determine the interactions. It helps us determine dosing, what's, what dosing is appropriate, what it treats, what its side effects are. And it also is a system that allows that if something turns out to be bad, they can pull it off the market because it's being tracked. With pot just being sold out there anyway to anybody, it's not tracked and it can't be retrieved. We have recalls all the time, dog food, cat food, what have you. There's a system that allows for that. So just to give you an analogy of how we develop medicine, would you use these as a medicine? Actually, you would, but you wouldn't crumble them up and roll them up in paper and smoke them. Taxol, which is a drug that is used to treat breast cancer victims, it comes from the yew tree. Opiates, of course, come from the poppy plant. We get anesthesia from the coca plant. We get penicillin from mold, and we get aspirin from willow bark, from the willow tree. I'll talk a little bit about specifically willow and, taxol, and the yew tree. Those products have in them many, many compounds. They have one compound that's medicinal, that's been isolated and replicated to create aspirin in the form of a pill. Taxol, I believe, is the pill. Um, but they have many things in them that are harmful, and in fact, in these particular situations, that are deadly. And marijuana really is, is no different. The marijuana, if we can find compounds that research says has medicinal value, isolate them and replicate them and, and produce them in an acceptable delivery system, we're completely okay with that, but not rolling it up and smoking it. So let me talk a couple of minutes about the Florida ballot initiative and what would it, what would it look like. It legalizes, first of all, not, not just the possession and use of marijuana, it legalizes the cultivation, the distribution, the sale and possession of it, and literally the marketing of it. And that's, to me, is the scary thing because what we're seeing in other states with the marketing efforts, it makes me nauseous to even think about it because it's being peddled heavily to everybody, including children. You should know that it's not special pot. It's just street pot. Some people think medical marijuana is some special grade. It isn't. It contains, can contain, I mean, it's, you, those of you in law enforcement can confirm this. It's very common that marijuana has in it fungi, pesticides, uh, fertilizers and what have you because that's used in order to grow the crop and the way in which it's processed it breeds fungi. It's not something sick people need to have. It allows, the, the petition allows for marijuana edibles and what we've seen in other states are edibles that sometimes get packaged to look like cookies and candies and uh, I know when one of the dispensaries I went in in Colorado they offered me a lollipop that had THC in it. This becomes attractive to children, and we've had um, a number of reports of children that have gotten sick and actually ended up in the emergency room over this. This proposed initiative allows ID card holders and caregivers to possess an unspecified amount of pot and pot plants, so there's no limit at this point of what could be grown or possessed. It lists several medical conditions that can be treated with it, but it allows other conditions, so really and truly, Anybody with any ailment could say, I need marijuana as a medicine. 
we went through this process in my office and everybody in my office qualifies. And I guarantee you, everybody here in this room has some condition you could qualify to get marijuana under the guise of medicine. It allows for minors to get medical marijuana and qualify without requiring guardian permission. It does not require a prescription. I don't care what the media keeps saying. It does not, there's no prescription. Nobody can prescribe marijuana. It's illegal at the federal level, no matter what states vote on, and it's a Schedule I drug and it cannot be prescribed. It's a recommendation, which is very, very different than a prescription. It does not require the recommending physicians to be in good standing with the state. They can be licensed, but they don't have to be in good standing. There's no language in the initiative that says that. It allows recommendations by podiatrists, naturopaths, chiropractors, osteopaths, and pain doctors even the unscrupulous ones. Now, I'm not saying any of these doctors are bad doctors, but what I am saying is these doctors listed here, other than the pain doctors, typically don't give prescriptions for controlled substances. And while there isn't a prescription process if this thing passes, these kinds of doctors would be able to write a recommendation for the, for the narcotic known as marijuana. So it really broadens who can do that. It allows personal caregivers to assist people with their drug use, and there's no restriction. The caregivers can be their drug dealers. There's, they can be a felony, a felon. It's, there's no restriction on it. Um, it limits caregivers to five individuals. However, employees of hospice providers, nursing or medical facilities may serve more individuals and are not restricted to do so within their jobs. So if you're a hospice worker, in your spare time, the way this is written, you could have as many patients that you're looking after as you want because you're a hospice worker. Now, some of this can get tightened with regulations, I grant you that, but I'm just telling you what it is right now. It's wide open. It allows for medical marijuana treatment centers to be registered by the Department of Health. That doesn't mean that Department of Health employees are going to run these facilities. It just means that Whoever opens the shop just registers with the Department of Health. Think pill mills. Think pill mills, because that's exactly what we would have, except they'd be marijuana mills or pot shops. The so-called medical marijuana treatment centers would acquire, cultivate, possess, transfer, transport, sell, distribute, dispense, or administer pot and pot-related products. The Department of Health employees would be subject to federal prosecution. And we've had several attorneys generals around the country actually issue legal opinions on this, that if state employees are involved in the process, which they would be based on the language of this proposed initiative, they would be subject to prosecution at the federal level. There are no restrictions about where these centers would be located. They could be potentially in your neighborhood. That's what we've seen in a lot of these states. They could potentially be next to your kid's school, next to your church, next to your temple. It's, there's no restriction about the location. And there's no restriction about criminals working at these centers. Here's a biggie. There's, this is, the language you see up here are direct quotes right out of the text of the initiative. It says that if the ID cards are not issued within nine months after this proposal passes, if it passes, then Physicians could just go ahead and start certifying people without registering. It also says that if the regulations are not um, in place, that anybody can sue. It actually changes legal standing in our state. So you can imagine the, the uh, cost to the state over that issue. Okay. Um, we think it'll be an expensive endeavor. You hear people saying, well, it'll raise some taxes, but I'll address that for you in a minute. It's going to cost money to set up the program. It's going to cost money to manage it. It's going to cost money to deal with compliance issues because I, I can guarantee you there will be violations of compliance. We've seen it in every other state where they're selling other drugs, where they're selling to minors, where they're selling um, other things like weapons and things under the table. I guarantee you there will be compliance issues. It's going to cost us to defend the inevitable lawsuits. It's going to increase law enforcement budgets due to uh, increased crime and 
the fallout they have to deal with. We've seen it in other states. I can guarantee you that will happen. And um, we will see an increase in healthcare expenses because addiction will go up, use will go up, impaired driving will go up, emergency room visits will go up. I'm gonna take you through some pictures real quick. I won't spend a lot of time with them, but I will tell you, and, I, and I'm gonna step back for just a minute because I wanna be really clear about this. Not everybody that supports this is a bad person. Not everybody that supports this is about legalization. There are truly some sick people that believe this is gonna help them. And I would love to be able to sit down with those people and show them the science and show them how this could potentially harm them because marijuana actually has been shown to suppress the immune system. And if they're smoking it, they're putting themselves at greater risk for cancer and other respiratory issues and on and on and on. So there are people that have been misinformed about it, but I will tell you the people driving it, the people across the country that fund this, that put millions of dollars into getting a weed legalized instead of putting it into legitimate research so that we can advance the um, compounds in marijuana that might have medicinal value, those folks are running a scam on the public and they will deceive. This picture right here, what it shows, the guy in the, um, in the lower photograph there in the black shorts and the black t-shirt and the black hat with the sign that says pills kill, he's up there in that top photo sitting in a wheelchair this was taken on the steps of the Capitol in the state of Pennsylvania when they were battling a medical marijuana initiative there. And one of my colleagues snapped this at the end when the guy walked down the steps and left his wheelchair. I have a bunch of other pictures. I only put two up there for you to see. I've run into them. I've run into people that claim they're blind and need this to help their blindness. And then they later drive away in their cars. And again, I'm not saying this is the case, with not everybody is a, is a fake, but I'm telling you, you can't always believe everything that you see there. Why would it be bad for Florida? The societal cost would far outweigh any kind of revenue that would be gener generated from it if somebody's looking at it strictly from that. And it would be bad for us as a, as a community, as a society. Child abuse and child neglect are involved with substance abuse, not just marijuana, but all drugs. Um, two thirds are involved in substance abuse of these cases. Foster care, up to 80% of foster care children are there because of drug and alcohol abuse in parents. Domestic violence, 61% of the um, offenders have substance abuse problems. And on and on and on, you see them listed here. All of these things are interrelated to substance abuse. It's interesting because people are always saying, you know, we're arresting marijuana users, but we're not arresting alcohol users. That's not true. There are a lot of people in jail because of alcohol. Because when people's brains are impaired, they do, pardon me, stupid things. They use bad judgment and they end up doing things that cause them to end up in jail. So what about the tax benefits for medical marijuana? Well, first of all, we don't typically tax medicine. So if it's a medicine, why would we be taxing it? And there was a big debate in Tallahassee about whether or not this could be taxed and, and their conclusion was they don't know. Certainly they would pick up some regulatory fees and that kind of thing. But the societal costs would be far greater. I mean, just look at tobacco and alcohol. This little chart right here shows you the revenue generated from alcohol is 14 billion, but the societal costs are $185 billion. Tobacco. 25 billion generated in taxes, 200 billion for societal cost. I don't think that marijuana would be any different. I think that these states that have gone down the road are gonna really be paying the price way down the road. <clears throat> Some more pictures for you. These are actual pictures taken in states that have legalized marijuana as a so-called medicine. This was taken in Oregon. This is actually in somebody's backyard. These are not plants, these are trees. These trees, you can see the guy there, how much taller they are. I don't know why we call them marijuana plants anymore. This was in somebody's back, neighbor's backyard. Do you want that next to you? Do you want this? This is a marijuana grow house. This is where you hear about fires because they run wiring all kinds of illegal ways and overload it, steal electricity, and they end up with house fires or building fires. Um, do you want, uh, 
marijuana to cause our state to become a marijuana tourism state. I mean, we are known worldwide for our tourism. We're a beautiful, pristine, beach-type state. We're known for our sunshine and our beautiful beaches. This has happened in Colorado in particular. Um, this actually comes off of a website. Tour guide wants to turn Denver into the Napa Valley of weed. Have you ever seen Denver? Yes, but have you ever seen Denver? Hi, man. Now they're running limo services now that they have full-blown legalization, but they were doing this even before when it was only medicine. Um, would you like our boardwalks on our beaches to look like this? This is Venice Beach, California. <clears throat> the guy in the green is the doctor's assistant. These are the sick people that they're trying to help. This is what our kids would be exposed to. Sometimes they have girls out in bikinis with signs that say the doctor is in. It's very medicinal. Florida cannot afford another pill mill epidemic with but it being pot shops this time around. And I can assure you that's what would happen. I can absolutely assure you it'll be some of those same doctors. What we see in these states is not people go into their regular doctor, but go into these facilities, these dispensaries, or going to where the doc they actually, in some states, they require them to separate. So they go one place, they pay $250 cash or whatever the amount is to get their recommendation and then they go over here so they can buy their pot. And they'll never see the doctor again. We actually in some states had to go in and set up some regulations because we had doctors seeing the patients via Skype. Okay? By the way, 90% of the people on average of the states that are reporting, we can't get the data from some states, but of the states that are reporting on average 90% of the patients are treating a category called pain. Now, I'm not making light of pain. I myself suffer every day from chronic pain and have for years. But what we have documented is people uh, smoking pot to treat headaches, menstrual cramps, back aches. Uh, we documented one guy treating athlete's foot, uh, one guy treating a hernia because he said he was too active sexually, and on and on and on. It is sometimes a joke. Pain is a subjective thing. It's not what gets promoted to the public. We tell the public it's for people dying with cancer, with AIDS, with glaucoma, with ALS, but 90% on average across the country are treating pain. Less than 10% of the card holders that we're able to track are actually using it for cancer, HIV, AIDS, or glaucoma combined. Typically states with marijuana programs have higher use, youth use rates. Here's a chart that was put together. This was, the source on this is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, this is the, um, from 2010 to 2011, past month marijuana users. All those you see there with red are states that have legalized marijuana as a so-called medicine. You can't help but conclude that this is driving up use by our young people because they're getting a mixed message. What they're hearing is marijuana is medicine, therefore it can't be very harmful. That's what drove up the prescription drug problem, was kids saw it as medicine and therefore it couldn't be harmful. This chart is a little busy, but I'm going to explain to you what it is. Up at the very top left, you see past year marijuana use in red, and you see perception of harm in green. And the very top bars are 2013, and the ones underneath of it are 1991. You can see how perception of harm and, and um, the perception of harm has dramatically decreased, and the use has dramatically increased. And this reinforces what we've known for years now by looking at the Monitoring the Future survey. Monitoring the Future survey has consistently shown since the 70s, back when it was called a different name, has shown that when the perception of the harm of drugs go up, use goes down. And when the perception of harm drops, use goes up. So when we're labeling marijuana as a medicine and we're letting people market it and commercialize it and you know, stick it in front of your nose all the time, 
kids get the idea that it's harmless and that's what happens. The chart to your left there with the pink bar and the orange bar, that shows how the potency level has gone up. Uh, in 1995, the average was 3.75% of THC. 2013, it hit 15%. <clears throat> and the bottom one down there shows um, daily use. Um, this is a current survey for 2000, the year of 2013. It shows the, the far left would be 12th graders, then 10th graders, then 8th graders. The blue bars show daily, uh, show, I'm sorry, um, use that year. The red ones show use that month, and the green ones show daily users. <clears throat> Marijuana use would increase um, use. 73.8% of adolescents surveyed in Denver. Substance abuse treatment programs reported using Medipot, I prefer to call it as opposed to medical marijuana because I don't like to give the impression it's marijuana, that it's medicine. Um, they said that it was recommended by somebody else. <clears throat> in other words, they're getting somebody else's medicine. I put medicine in brackets. A study in London, because we look at this on an international level, because some countries have had more experience than the U.S. has with liberal drug laws, found the likelihood that a young person who had never smoked cannabis would try the drug went up 25% after they liberalized their drug laws. They've now rolled back their laws on marijuana because of the impact they saw. A study in South London found a 40 to 100% increase in hospital admissions following their liberalization of marijuana laws before they rolled it back. Colorado has reported a significant increase in emergency room visits since marijuana became medicine. Um, we actually have seen from, to, from 05 to 09, their hospital out there, the children's hospital, had zero ER visits during that time period that had ingested marijuana. Now because of all of the marijuana infused food products out there, we've seen that jump to 14 this past year. We've seen mass marketing occurring in all of these states, but really now in Colorado with full-blown legalization. We've had um, reports out there of kids getting text messages on their cell phones promoting it. They have these apps that are um, weed trackers that'll tell you where you can go to any of the dispensaries to get pot. And I might tell you, we've done a really good job in Florida restricting smoking cigarettes, but most of our ordinances are written to specifically restrict tobacco use, tobacco smoking. And this has happened in other states where the cities have had to go back and redo their ordinances to include any kind of smoking. Increased injuries and deaths from impaired driving, a concern that should be everybody's. Um, drivers who test positive for marijuana are 2.7 times as likely as other drivers to be involved in a crash, according to the Columbia University School of Public Health. Even small amounts of pot can double your chances of a crash and larger doses can more than triple the risk. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be on the highway with it. It's always interesting when people talk about their rights to use, but they forget about my rights and what my family is exposed to. Also in the workplace. I can tell you, I did a study years ago um, looking at the workplace and after tracking drug tests for six months, 68% of the people that were drug tested couldn't pass a drug test after an accident. In other words, they were involved in an accident. I'm convinced it was a contributor. And most of the drugs we were picking up back then was pot. Once in a while we'd pick up some, methamphetamine hadn't hit the market at the time, so once in a while we'd get some amphetamines, once in a while we'd get some cocaine, but it was mostly marijuana. 68% couldn't pass their drug test after being tested after accidents. I am convinced it's a contributor. Five years after establishing a medical marijuana program, California saw a near 100% increase in fatal crashes where at-fault drivers tested positive for marijuana. According to the Colorado Department of Transportation, drivers testing positive for marijuana doubled between 06 and 2010, following an influx of pot shops and significant increases in registered medical marijuana users. I'm just giving you a teeny sampling, teeny sampling. 
So I ask you, do you want your child's school bus driver smoking pot before reporting to work? Do you want to drive on highways with tractor trailer drivers? I've had a lot of them today coming down the road. I'm sure glad they all stayed in their lane. Do you want your teenager riding in a car with a schoolmate mate that's smoking? I'm gonna show you some more pictures. These are photographs from actual grow sites where marijuana has been legalized as a so-called medicine. This is the kind of stuff that gets left behind. Pesticides, fertilizers, tr just plastic bags, plastic bottles, trash. They don't clean up. And these were legal grows. And the terracing. They don't always go back and fix the terracing. Here's more. Now this did not come from a grow site. Disclaimer on that. I've included this to get you to think about the fact that we have lots and lots of lakes and lots of beaches. And based on what we're seeing in other states, the way things get discarded, do we want this? This is the fisher. He's a little, cute little animal. Up in Oregon, in Washington State, he has become almost extinct. In some areas, he is literally gone now because he has gotten into the pesticides and eaten some of the products there from the marijuana grows and died. Now what we're also seeing, based on what we're hearing from um, the animal people, is that sometimes these animals get eaten by predators, and now some of the predators are getting sick because they're eating a, an animal that's poisoned. So I don't know about you, but I treasure our wildlife here in Florida. Wildfires could increase. We live in a state where we have wildfires from time to time. In California, they have a huge problem. It's not all related to marijuana. But 93,535 acres were lost between 06 and 11 in California due to growth site initiated fires. The cost to, just to suppress the fires, doesn't count all the other stuff, just to suppress them, was $35 million. Do we want that in Florida? Animal abuse and torture will increase. These are, these are animals that are, this is very common in these grow areas where they chain these dogs up and use them like alarm systems. And then when they're through, a lot of times they leave the animals behind and they abuse them to make them mean. I just got a report just hit my desk uh, Friday, as a matter of fact. The National Animal Poison Control Center reports increases in marijuana poisonings of animals from 219 calls in 2009 to 320 calls in 2013. Marijuana can kill animals. This is a photograph from a grow site, uh, from a dispensary, pardon me, in um, Oregon. It was raided. The marijuana you see laying down there, I think that's the marijuana they actually have to give back to the people because it was legal. They, the rest of it they get to keep. Um, and take away because they had over the limit allowed. But they had all these weapons which clearly got confiscated. Maybe this is the pot they get to take away, I'm not sure. But it's very, the point I want to make is that it's very common for weapons to be found in these facilities. And it's very common for people with serious criminal records to be working in these facilities, dispensing medicine. So to wrap up, who opposes pot as medicine? Our major medical groups do, including all the ones that they claim that marijuana treats, the National Glaucoma Society, the National Leuke Leukemia Society, the American Medical Association, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. They all oppose it. What does that tell you? Um, the National Institutes of Health Agencies all oppose it. The FDA has opposed it. The um, Office of National Drug Control Policy, who studied it, opposes it. The U.S. Surgeon General's Office has opposed it. The National Institutes on Drug Abuse that does all the research, that funds all the research in the country, opposes it. What does that tell you? They support the compounds that can be turned into medicine, but they oppose crude marijuana as medicine. And in Florida, although the media doesn't talk about it, we filed a, a petition to try to stop the ballot initiative. You only hear about Pam Bondi. We filed one, and our partners included the naturals that you would think, the Florida Police Chiefs Association and the Florida Sheriff's Association, but it also included the Florida Medical Association and the Florida Chamber of Commerce. When you have the lead medical group in the state saying this is a bad ballot initiative, you've got to listen to it. It's not about medicine. Who, su who supports it? 
I've already said I acknowledge there are some people who are sick who, you know, they do feel better when they smoke it. That's why people use drugs. And they are not properly informed about the science and how they might be harming themselves. So there are some that are in that category. There are some that feel compassion for sick people until they learn more about the issue. I fell in that category at one time. Uh, I've, lost I've lost family members that I care deeply for to cancer. And I know what you know, the desperation is when you are losing somebody like that. There are libertarian-minded individuals who are ill-informed and think people should just be able to do whatever. Uh, you know, there's that states' rights issue, and I ask people when they raise that issue, so do you think that states, if they think slavery is okay, they should just be able to legalize slavery? I don't think so. So there are some things that we have to agree if we're going to be a United States, we have to be consistent with. We also have international drug control treaties that we're bound by. Um, but the mostly the people that are supporting it, the ones that are putting the big bucks behind it, the ones that are promoting it across the country, they're not medical people. They are drug legalization advocates. They come right back to the states and say, now we're going to legalize it um, for recreational purposes. They broaden them. They start out, if they have one that's restricted, and then they broaden them, treat more conditions, treat more conditions, have, be able to um, possess more, grow more, and what have you. So, the, and I will tell you what we're seeing now. This is really important. We are seeing the development of a big marijuana industry, not, not unlike the big tobacco industry, except much, I think, is going to be much bigger. Even some of the members of legislatures and governors that supported stuff, now we've been able to link them to having ownership in marijuana dispensaries. The governor in Montana, the citizens there, did a petition to stop medical marijuana. The governor vetoed it, and now it turns out his family members have ownership in a couple of dispensaries there. So there are people positioned to make money off of it that will do whatever it takes to make it go through. So my conclusion is that Floridians with legitimate illnesses deserve safe and effective medicine, not a cancer-causing toxic weed that does more harm than good, actually suppresses the immune system. Labeling pot as medicine will create a dangerous illusion that it's safe and it will send a mixed message to our kids that can be harmful. And the proposed initiative, even if you think, even after you've heard me, if you still think marijuana should be allowed as medicine, this initiative is not the way to do it. It's very broadly worded. It'll leave our state wide open for very significant abuses, and it's going to cost us a lot of money. And I thank you. And I know we're out of time, but I want to <laughs> take a quick minute. Does anybody have a question that maybe you didn't answer today that you thought you would get when you walked in here? Testing. Uh, could you tell me what you know about the financial financing of these clinics and, and pot growing areas where they're, when they're legalizing? Who finances these businesses? And the money that is paid for this, what banks or institutions are using it? I mean, is there, is there an issue there? They're, they are privately funded. I mean, they're just business people that see an opportunity to make money that set up these facilities, um, that set up the grow sites, that set up the uh, dispensary shops, uh, the doctors that go into business. Well, one of the things I can tell you about some of the doctors, there are exceptions. There are always exceptions to everything. But by far, the majority of these doctors we're seeing, that's what they're specializing in. I mean, we, for example, in the state of Hawaii, the top, there are basically 10 doctors for all of Hawaii that are recommending pot. There are a couple of exceptions, but by far it's these 10 doctors. And one of those 10 doctors wrote over half of their recommendations, and it was like 24,000 recommendations. I mean, I don't even know where this doctor has time to write the recommendations, let alone see the patients. But it's, all, it's private. I mean, it's entrepreneurship. That's why there are so many people you know, that jump on this and are so rabid about getting it uh, to move forward. They're making money off of it. Anybody else have a question? They didn't get answered? Okay. Well, I hope that this was informative for you. I know um, we get calls on a regular basis asking our position on, on this, and, and obviously we are, we are focused on the kids. We are all about the kids. And if nothing else, when you walk away from this, we are seeing 
that the kid usage rate will go up. And so for that, um, we obviously are against uh, legalization of marijuana in, in any capacity. So um, I just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to come out here. And please pass this on when you walk away and, and you have the ability to have a conversation with somebody else. Tell them what you've learned. There's materials on the way out with some websites that can help you um, if you want to have your facts available. Um, you can get facts from, from different websites that are, that are uh, back there on, a, on some information, some flyer information. So thank you very much for coming out. Uh, we value your time, and so we're going to... I've also put my websites yes. up here, um, and we have tons of research, so anybody that's needing something like that too. Yes, and Reach any any us. documentation you want um, for something that maybe you're doing, please feel free to contact us and we'll get you where the data came from. So thank you very much for coming out today.